coming towards palpation. Okay. So palpation, the very first uh, thing which you say when you present your palpatory findings is inspection findings confirmed because whatever you look for in inspection, that is again what you look for palpation, but this time you use, you use your hands and you feel. So superficial palpation is the first thing where you just use the dorsum of our hands and look for the local rise of temperature. Again, maybe if they suspect an empyema or just fever, you look for tenderness, you look for subcutaneous empyema, empyema, which might uh, be heard as a crepitus. The sound like this. Okay. So I'm just crushing a paper in between my fingers. That is the kind of sound which we might hear. Or just crushing of my hair between my fingers. This is the kind of sound which you might hear. Okay, so the next thing which we see here are the measurements of the chest. So previously in inspection, we just had an overlook. We overviewed uh, the chest for any symmetry, uh, for any breach in the symmetry or any deformity. But now we're going to measure them properly. So what are the measurements that we take? So in the measurement, the very first thing is the AP ratio, for which we have to use two cardboards. So if this is the patient. Remember that all of these uh, examinations we are going to do in the sitting position. Even the palpation, the percussion, the auscultation, that is the best position because we can see for and look for all the three sides, the anteriorly, laterally, as well as posteriorly. So this is the person and this is his anterior side. This is the posterior side and this is lateral. We make this person to hold two cardboards like this. Okay. And these cardboards, we are going to measure from this cardboard to that cardboard. We find out the AP ratio, AP, AP diameter. Then the transverse diameter again. We make the patient hold the cardboards here. Here one cardboard and the other cardboard on the other side. And from one cardboard to other, we are going to measure again the transverse diameter. Then we take out its ratio. Has to be between 5 is to 7, which is normal. The hemithorax diameter. That means if this is the patient's sternum and that is the patient's spine, so from here to the mid sternum and from here to the mid sternum, we are going to measure the circumferences. So that is called as the hemithorax diameter. It has to be almost equal. If there is slightly depressed, this hemithorax diameter is slightly less, this is slightly more. We don't know yet which one is the abnormal one, but either this side has a collapsed lung or this side has an expanded lung, maybe because of a pleural effusion, maybe because of a hydronephrax, maybe because of a very severe empyema causing chest, entrap uh, chest uh, air entrapment, but it's unlikely that empyema is going to be on one side, has to be by that. Okay. Then you are going to keep your tape from this side to that side. Okay. And measure. It's just expansion. So when the lung expands from one tape to other tape, this an increase in the distance has to be at least what five to seven centimeters, as we had read previously. So it has to be somewhat five to seven centimeters. In hemithorax expansion, then you measure if this is five to seven centimeters, so it has to be somewhere between three point five centimeters on each side. It has to be equal. If any one side is not expanding properly, there is some problem on that side. You know that and you, you are able to give more attention to understand what that problem is further in your percussion and auscultation. Okay, so these were the measurements we did. Now what are the movements? So the movements, we have divided those movements to be measured on the anterior, the posterior and the apical side. Okay, we don't measure the movements specifically in the axilla. So remember, this is one common mistake that we tend to make. We also go to measure the movement in the axilla. There is no such movement measurement in the axilla. We look for the anterior movements, the posterior side and the pipe. So how do we look for that? Let's uh, look at a few images here. So this is the apical movement measurement. We're keeping our thumbs posteriorly. We're standing in the back of the patient and the fingers are going in the supraclavicular area. Okay. And what kind of movement do we want to see when we're looking for the apex? So again, there is a mistake with the students make. When they stand on the back side and they are measuring the apical movements, these students try to separate their thumbs 
they try to separate their thumbs and say, yeah, the movement are happening, the thumbs are separating. No, ma'am. Why would be there a moment of uh, separation between the thumbs at the apex? At the apex, we want to see the expansion of the apex and when the apex expands, these fingers should elevate, these fingers should elevate from their positions. That is what the moment which we are expecting at the apex. So, if you come towards the mechanics of respiratory movements, you remember we studied different physiology. At the apex, remember the ribs which are attached here at the sternum. So, what kind of movement happens here? The ribs which are attached at the sternum, are going to elevate the sternum slightly. This is the kind of movement which is happening. Superior and anterior movement in the sternum. And this movement is called as a pump handle movement. Okay. So when you have placed your fingers here, okay, I cannot write here because this is the this is an image on Google. So just look at my cursor. If my fingers have been placed here, I want to see these fingers moving upwards like this. Elevation of my fingers should happen. That is the moment I'm expecting at the apex. I don't want my thumbs to see uh, to be separated. I don't want my examiner to look at my thumbs getting separated here. I want my examiner to notice that my fingers are lifting up because there is a pump handle movement happening at the apex. Okay. Then when we place our hands anteriorly and posteriorly, what movement would we, we want to see? So here this time our thumbs are going to separate. Why? Because the expansion which is happening in the transverse diameter. And besides that, I also want my fingers to slightly elevate. Why? Because my ribs are elevating laterally. So when my ribs are elevating laterally like a bucket handle, my fingers are going to elevate from the surface. They are going to move laterally and outwards. And my thumbs are going to separate and move outwards because of expansion of the transverse diameter. So the bucket handle movement and the pump handle movement has to reflect when I'm measuring the patient's respiratory movements by hand. I'm not measuring, I'm demonstrating. The measurement was when I uh, placed a tape on the transverse diameter, and the AP diameter, and then I measured the hemicoraxis. Thoracis. Okay. Now let's come back and see. So this time we measured, uh, we look for the elevation of the fingers. When we place our fingers in the anterior aspect, we put fan out our fingers laterally and the thumbs is in the midline. What are the movements which we are going to see here? The movement is going to be separation of the thumbs and the lateral elevation of the fingers, right? Lateral elevation of the fingers. And similarly, on the back side, when I'm going to measure, there will be separation of the thumbs and lateral elevation of the fingers. And where exactly we have to measure? One is at the apex, then anteriorly, where all? We have to measure your anteriorly one side and posteriorly one side. We don't have to keep on different positions and measure. It's okay. Only one position. Here at the apex, here at the anterior and one side. At the level of the nipples and here in the posterior side. You don't have to keep here and then here and then there. No need. One position and all of these sides. Okay. Good. So anything we have to read here. Let's see. All right. Let's come back and see the performance. So once we have looked for the movements of the anterior, posterior, and apex. We look at the pitya sternum again, and this time we are not just going to see the position of the sternocleidomastoid muscle and any prominence, but we are going to place our fingers on the trachea, slide it downwards, and then try to insinuate our fingers between the trachea and the sternocleidomastoid muscles of each side and see. Look at this. The kind of palpation of the trachea, we have put our finger, two fingers on one side and one finger in the midline, and then we try to insinuate our fingers in between. The trachea is examined by inserting finger upward in the suprasternal notch and noting its relation to the two sternal freedom aspect muscle. Normally, the trachea may be shifted slightly to the right or its central. So, this is the normal position which has to be seen. And the apex. The cardiac impulse which we have noted previously by seeing has to be confirmed by palpating this time. And we know how to palpate the cardiac impulse. The first thing is we place the entire palm in this lower area, in the lower inframammary area on the left side. Then when we are able to find out one point of impulse, we slightly go on narrowing down with one finger. 
and has to be somewhere in the left fifth intercostal space about half a centimeter laterally to the medial clavicular line. That is the normal position. What is the normal position? Let me write it down to you. It's in the left fifth intercostal space, half a centimeter lateral to medial clavicular line is where normally has to be. Okay. Now other miscellaneous things which we look for while palpating. So one is tactile vocus primitus and friction primitus. What is tactile vocal primitus? In all of those positions on the anterior, the lateral and the posterior sides, we place our fingers, our medial borders and the ulnar borders of our hands okay, in the intercostal spaces and we ask the patient to say something. Uh, mostly we ask them to say one 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 okay so when we ask them to say one 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 we are able to feel some primitives which is being transmitted through the parenchymas of the lungs and has to be equal on all the sides if it is increased on one side it might be suggestive of consolidation if it is decreased and not felt it can be because of pneumothorax so those are the the parameters which we have to This is how you have to place. I told you the ulnar border of your hands you have to place in the intercostal spaces and feel for those vibrations. So, what is tactile vocal primitives? It's the tactile perception of vibrations communicated to the chest wall from the larynx via the bronchi and the lungs during the act of formation. So, these sound vibrations which travel down and cause the lungs and chest wall to vibrate, but the spoken tones must have the same fundamental frequencies as the lung and the chest wall. Remember that the fundamental frequency of female voice is often higher than that of the lungs and therefore TVF may be markedly diminished or absent in women. In children, though it is high, TVF can be appreciated. So slightly it is decreased, but TVF is increased in whom? In consolidation, any infarction, any malignant leakage. Anything which makes the lung even more consolidated and able to transmit it to the chest wall, the TVF increases. Whereas it decreases whenever there is some other medium between the chest wall and the lung. For example, if there is fluid altering the transmission of sounds, or there is air altering the transmission of sound, or if there are both altering the transmission of sound, or there is any obstruction which is not allowing the sound to transmit, again air, or fibrosis, or collapse, but there is no vibrations possible to happen because there is no space in between the parenchyma. It's completely fibrous, it's collapsed, or there is air again. Okay. So this is how. And where all will you place your fingers? So I'll show you again on that body, on that patient which we have. So if this is your patient and you have to feel for the tactile vocal primitus, or even later on when we have to percuss, so what sides exactly do we percuss on? So the very first thing is the supraclavicular area on the anterior aspect. And when you do this, you don't go downwards like this on one side. You keep on percussing the same side on both the sides bilaterally so as to compare the sides together to feel if there is any increase or decrease on any, any one of the sides. Okay. So the supraclavicular, then here again, then infraclavicular, then here again. And then in the mammary area, we go from the second intercostal space all the way up to the sixth intercostal space. Because I told you that the anterior aspect of the lung along with its visceral pleura extends up to the sixth intercostal space. Now, when you start focusing the patient, who is in the sitting position again in the axilla? We focus or feel for the tactile vocal primitus here in the axillary area and the infraxillary area. So, this is going to be up till the eighth intercostal space in the axillary region. And then on the back side, when you're focusing, you focus on the supra scapular area in the interscapular area because these are your scapulae. So, this becomes your interscapular area here. You are going to focus with your hands being slightly more vertical instead of horizontal and then again in the infrascapular area you uh, extend approximately up till here which i suspect to be the 10th intercostal space so that is the extent of the lungs anteriorly it's the sixth intercostal space laterally it's the eighth intercostal space and posteriorly it's the 10th intercostal space and that is how you place your hands to feel for tactile vocal primitus as well as to focus later on which will be studying on both the sides simultaneously so as to compare the sounds which we feel or we hear 
in PDF versus on percussion, so as to be able to compare if there is any increase or decrease on either of the sides. Okay. okay so now we are done with our percussion. I'm sorry, palpation, right? The last thing which I wanted to mention was the palpable pleural rub. So this is basically uh, what whenever there is some friction between the two pleural surfaces. Okay. It may be because of thickening of the pleura associated with long standing tuberculosis or some other cause. If the two pleural layers are rubbing against each other, it can produce a friction which then transmits through the surface as something palpable, which is called as the friction primitus. Okay. So these are the miscellaneous uh, vibrations which can be felt on the surface of the lung on palpation. And if you have any other dilated vessels or any palpable pulsations, that also can be mentioned here. They are palpable. Now coming towards percussion. So what is percussion? Percussion is when you try to create your own vibration by stimulating the surface of the chest by tapping over it and then feel for the kind of vibrations which are felt by your fingers. So in palpation, we are looking for vibrations which are already present under it. For example, any, any of, of turbulence in the bronchi producing a bronchial primitus, any friction between the pleura producing pleural primitus. But those are vibrations which were present there already on their own. But when you percuss, you create vibrations by tapping on the surface of the lung and then feel for the, for the kind of vibrations which are felt by your hand. So that is percussion. So again, for percussion, you make the patient sit with their hands on their waist so that the entire area is properly uh, approachable for you. And then where exactly have you to focus? So percussion is done here at the anterior, anteriorly at the chronic systemus. So chronic systemus is somewhere above the clavicle. I'll talk about it properly, what it is. Then on the clavicle itself, without placing any finger, directly focus or tap over the clavicle. Then intraclavicular area in the mammary area from where to where up to the sixth intercostal space because that is the extent of the anterior lung. Then laterally, again, as I told you, the axillary area and the implant axillary area because you have to go up to the eighth intercostal space and then posteriorly from the suprascapular, interscapular, infrascapular till the 10th intercostal space or the 11th rib. So it's 10 to 11th rib. Okay. And then there are a few extra spaces which uh, differ from right to left. So this is the right hemithorax and the left hemithorax. So right hemithorax, because we have the liver here, uh, there is a specific percussion called tidal percussion. And on the left side, because we have the stomach spleen uh, and the left uh, lobe of the liver extending there, it's called as the throb space percussion. And we'll talk about it as well. Now, if you have a suspect, uh, suspected hydronemothorax in the patient, then there is something called shifting dullness, which you have to elicit. And in suspected pneumothorax, a coin percussion has to be elicited. Any patient who appears to be chronically malnourished with a very uh, thin build uh, loss of nutrition, you have to look for percussion myokinia, which is a phenomenon associated with weakened muscle over time. Correct? So an overview is enough for us to take us and let's discuss about percussion. Okay, so what is percussion? I told you about percussion. Where exactly you have to do percussion? I explained that as well. Now let's talk about the kinds of notes which can be felt. So remember that the normal percussion note of the chest is because of the underlying lung tissue. It contains normal amount of air in the vesicles, the air sacs and the passages. So it has a very clear character with low pitch. And the front of the chest yields a more resonant note than the back because of the less bulk of musculature in the front than in the back. Now there are a few notes which you need to know. One is the resonance node. The other one is called as the dull note. Which uh, has another variety called a stony dull note. And the third one is the tympanic note. So let's uh, first discuss where these nodes are normal and where these nodes become abnormal. So when we talk about the resonant node, this is normal in the lungs. Why? Because lungs have this particular parenchyma with spaces, and these spaces are filled with air. So such kind of a tissue which has 
a little bit of interwoven connective tissue with air containing spaces that has to produce a node which is called as resonant node. So any normal person just go and tap over him on the lungs, the kind of noise or the kind of sound which is generated and which is heard is called your resonant node. Okay. Now what is dull node? So dull node is over a tissue which is completely solid. So there is no air spaces as such. And that kind of a tissue is producing a dull node. So this is normal on the liver. Okay. Normal in the liver, normal in the spleen. And when does it become abnormal? It becomes abnormal when it is present in the lungs. And that means these air spaces have got filled with something. They have completely become solid now. There is no air as such. And that happens where? It happens in consolidation. That is in pneumonia. It can happen in a pulmonary infarction. It can happen in, where else? Uh, anything else? Yeah, fibrosis. Any infiltration. So fibrosis can also produce that kind of a sound. And this is abnormal here. Now, when does it become a stony dull node? So, if there is something completely filled with fluid, so this time it was a complete solid substance. If this is completely filled with fluid, this same node becomes slightly different in character and that kind of a character is called a stony dull. So, can you tell me where stony dull can be present abnormally on the lungs? Yeah, it's present on pleural effusion. A pleural effusion can produce a kind of stony dull node. Even empyema can produce that kind of a node. It has to be slightly uh, fluidish. It has cotton fibros and it can come back to dull node. Okay. And what is tympanic node? Tympanic node is kind of a drum-like resonance. Something just completely filled with air. So here we saw that there was some interwoven connective tissue with little spaces filled with air. But this is not interwoven connective tissue. This is a complete space, a complete single space which is filled with air. So when such a space exists completely filled with air, then that kind of a resonance produces something like a drum-like sound. So it produces a drum-like sound, which is called tympanic. Okay, so where this can be present normally? Normally, it can be present in anywhere where there is air-filled spaces like stomach or your intestines. That has to be normally tympanic. But when can that become abnormal? It becomes abnormal over your lung when the pleural spaces are filled with air. And that is called pneumothorax. Right? Pneumothorax, so any superficial empty cavity where the lung parenchyma is destroyed and is completely trapped with air, so superficial uh, lung air cavity or emphysema where there is complete destruction of the respiratory membranes and formation of air trapped spaces that becomes a completely inflated lung that is an emphysema. So pneumothorax, emphysema and all can produce this tympanic. And then if you talk about tympanic, there is another variety of tympanic which is called as subtympanic. And subtympanic note is basically when if there is a fluid filled space, okay, this is pleural effusion, a fluid filled space, and just above that, the lung, if percussed, will give a sound as that of a tympanic node, but it's not as close to tympanic, neither it's very close to resonance, so somewhere in between. Okay, we might not be able to actually distinguish unless we have like percussed a thousand of patients over a lifetime, but uh, it's important that you know the theory at least. And that is called as spodiac resonance, hyper resonant. Why do we call it hyper resonant? Because it's more than resonant, but it's under tympanic. So it's hyper resonant or under tympanic. Also called as spodiac. Boxy nature, boxy character. It's not completely drum like, something like a box. And uh, this is above, over a relaxed lung, just above the level of pleural effusion. So where do we feel it? On a relaxed lung, just above a pleural effusion. That is where you feel for this. So now we've understood one is resonant note, one is dull note, stony dull note, tympanic note, sub tympanic or scudaic resonance. Resonant is normal, dull note is when it becomes completely solid, like a liver, for example, consolidation, infarction, fibrosis. Stony dull when there is complete fluid filled, for example, pleural effusion and pyma. Tympanic note when there is a complete open space filled with air. It's not like a connective tissue with air spaces, it's a complete open space filled with air. For example, stomach and intestine, and in the lung, it is seen in pneumothorax and superficial lung cavities. Then, subtympanic is something which is hyper resonant, but not exactly tympanic or scudaic resonance, which is associated with a lung above the level of a pleural effusion. All right, so percussion notes are done. Now, there were some specific areas which was chronic dystonus. On the right side, we called uh, the drop space area. On the left, no, the right side, we call it what? Uh, yeah. The right side we call it as a tidal percussion. The left side we call it as the drop space area. And shifting dullness, point as percussion myopia. So all of that we're going to see 
uh, by referring to Meta. I'll take you back to the book. So till now we've understood all the types of sounds. Now what is chronic system? So it's actually the apex of the lung. So the apex of the lung above the clavicular area on both the sides is called as the chronic system, which is medially what? Medially it has your um, lung dullness of the neck muscles. So this is the sternum. Here we have the neck muscles. On the lateral side, we have the shoulder muscles. And beneath it is the part of the lower parts of the lung. But this basically is consisting of what? It's consisting of your apex. So when you concuss supraclavicularly, that particular area has a fancy name called the chronic systemus. And when will it become abnormal? If there is absence on either side, it may be because of pulmonary fibrosis. Because in the, in the later stages of TB, the upper portion which is affected with TB finally becomes fibrosed. And that fibrosis will produce type of a dull node. So there is a dull node on any side. It could be suggestive of pulmonary fibrosis or increased width of resonance here can be suggestive of emphysema. Okay? It's because more and more lung is uh, trapped with air and that will produce increased resonance. So that is associated with emphysema. That's all about chronic systems. Coming towards liver dullness and its fan. So remember that your normal liver dullness in the right intercostal space is in the fifth space in the mid-clavicular line, seventh space in the anterior axillary line, and ninth space in the scapular line. Okay, You can say fifth or sixth. And here it's around in the 7th or 8th and 9th or 10th. So as we remember the lung extent, the lung extent was up to the 6th space and 8th space and 10th space. I told you in the mid-clavicular, mid-axillary and feature in the scapular line or anterior axillary uh, scapular line. right? So that is exactly where your liver will also start. So somewhere in the 5th, 6th your liver will start. Somewhere in the 7th, 8th your liver will start. Somewhere in the 9th, 10th your liver will start. So since your liver is starting there, when you start percussing downwards, the liver dullness will start at one point, right? So liver dullness may be present in the fourth space in the mid-clavicular line if there is an amoebic or pyogenic abscess. So anything which expands the liver upwards because of some abscess formation will encroach upon the area of the lung upwards. And so your fourth space will suddenly become dull on percussion in the mid-clavicular line. And it may be pushed down in the sixth space or seventh space in the mid-clavicular line if the lung is hyper-expanded as an emphysema or there is pneumothorax or there is air in the peritoneal cavity and in terminal cirrhosis also. So if it is pushed down or pushed up, for that you're looking for the liver dullness. So in this case, how are you going to start percussing the patient? In this case, I'll show you. If this is the patient, I told you how normal percussion is to be done and you have to compare both the sides. So you go here to here, here to here. But when you have to demonstrate uh, liver dullness, so if your examiner tells you, okay, go on and demonstrate liver dullness and tell me where exactly it is. So what are you going to do? Are you going to percuss here and here, here and here? No. Now, your purpose to percuss is to find out the liver dullness. So you go all the way from up to down on the right side only. So you start here, you percuss, you percuss, you percuss, you percuss. Okay, so you, at one point you feel that the resonance is, uh, the percussion nodes are going slightly different. So suppose here you felt something different, you felt something different. You go back up and then again compare. Okay, so you felt there is something different. Then you go downwards until you feel the same node and that changes to something else. So this entire area of liver dullness which changes, you are going to measure this area again by feeling for the Louis angle that is between the head of the sternum and the body of the sternum, this Louis angle just below it will be having what? The first intercostal space, the second intercostal space, third intercostal, fourth intercostal. And finally, you keep on measuring, find out where exactly the liver dullness is lying. And then you ask the patient to inspire deeply and you feel the dullness slightly goes down on inspiring. So if it was in sixth intercostal space previously, the dullness might go by seven intercostal space or eight intercostal space on inspiring deeply. So that is the normal, the normal right sided liver dullness or span. Okay. And anything abnormal, as I mentioned it, as it was uh, shown in Mecca, you have to tell. All right. So, we talked about liver dullness and span. What else? On the left side. So, left side, we have two different dullnesses. One is your cardiac dullness, and the other is the tidal percussion. So, what is that? On the left side of the chest wall, as we know, the lung resonance has a slight area of encroachment because of cardiac dullness because of the presence of the heart. And where does it normally lie? It lies in the third and the fourth left parasternal areas and fifth left midaglandular line. So this, this is the sternum in the third, fourth parasternum and fifth midclavicular mid line. So this is where exactly the, the heart is going to lie. And any case, if the heart is pushed towards the uh, left side because of enlargement of the lung, this area might be slightly shifted towards the right side. Or if there is push coming from the right side, the lung is expanded ex excessively, the right side of the lung is filled with fluid or something else, there is a pure effusion, this can be pushed 
leftwards. So any change in this area of cardiac dullness might tell you. The area of cardiac dullness is decreased in emphysema and left pneumothorax. The pneumothorax is completely covering over the heart. And there is a change of medium between the heart and the pleural area and then the chest wall. So this dullness might not be transmitted in cases of a pneumothorax. And so it might be decreased also. Cardiomegaly, it might be increased, pushed on any side, depending upon the causes. Okay, so that is what is the cardiac dullness. And again, on the left side, we have something called a tidal percussion. Okay, right, right. this is right side only. So when we are measuring for the liver dullness in span, we also look for something called a tidal percussion. Percussion of the upper border of the liver dullness on inspiration and expiration keeps on changing, right? Because of the lung expansion. So that is what we have to demonstrate. So in pulmonary disease of the lung basis, it might not change because of fibrosis. If there is empyema, the dullness may remain the same because of the infection has been occupied in the space. There is amebiasis, it might not change. In the subdiaphragmatic abscess, it will still remain dull. In diaphragm palsy, the diaphragm is not able to function. There is no expansion on that side, so the dullness might not change to resonance on inspiration. So that changes are specifically called as tidal percussion. So liver dullness and span has to go together with tidal percussion together because they are similar. Okay. And then on the left side, we have to look for Traub's area or space. So what is Traub's area? Traub's area is uh, bounded superiorly by the by the lung resonance. And on the right side, there is the left lobe of liver. And on the left side, there is spleen, and below there is the costal margins. And what is contained in this area? I told you. The area is contained by the stomach. So, on percussion, any space which is completely filled with air, the percussion note has to be drum like tympanic, right? So, anything makes this tympanic percussion to become dull is suggestive of something which is encroaching from above. That means the pleural effusion is pressing down, or the liver is enlarged, or the spleen is enlarged, the splenomegaly, or there is a tumor inside the stomach, or the stomach is completely full just after a full meal. So, all of these can cause you drops area dullness. And then shifting dullness. So, what is shifting dullness? Do you know that in hydro-pneumothorax, when you look at chest x-ray, you're not going to see the Ellie's curve. It is not going to be like this. Why? Because the pleural space is filled half with fluid and half with air. So the fluid exactly has this perfect air-fluid interface. So just above this, it's going to be having air. It's just below it, it's going to be fluid. So very perfect air-fluid interface is seen in a pneumothorax. So when this patient is sitting and you focus on the patient's axilla, at one particular point, you find dullness. Here there is resonance. Here this is dullness. Okay. And this uh, can also be slightly more towards the tympanic nose. So this might be tympanic and this is going to be dull. And now you ask this patient who is sitting to lie down on the side which is normal. So if this is the normal side of the lung, you will go laterally to that side to lie down. Uh, so this is going to be the left lateral decubitus. So on left lateral decubitus, the patient in the lying down position, again you're going to percuss here and here. What happens? This fluid is going to shift down on this side. right? So this side is going to get completely fluid with fluid. When the patient now gets lied down like this, with the normal lung on the ground, what happens is the fluid now is going to shift down here. This is the fluid. And now again, in the axillary area, when you percuss, what happens? This is going to be normal or it's going to be tympanic. This is also going to become tympanic. So the area which was dull on sitting became tympanic on lying down. This particular phenomenon is called the shifting dullness and helps you to demonstrate the presence of hydronomothorax. All right. And coming towards point this, so you put a point on the anterior surface of the chest, okay, on one side the lung, and then what do you do? You percuss with another coin. You put up another coin and percuss. And then posteriorly, this is the anterior portion, posteriorly you're going to auscultate. So when you auscultate, the sound will be exactly like a metal or a bell, okay, when you auscultate. So see for a normal patient, try to do the same, and you might not feel the sound to be like a metal or a bell. But in a patient who is a pneumothorax, uh, has a pneumothorax, a patient who has a pneumothorax will rather have this kind of metallic sound and that's called the coin test. So these are all uh, usually going to be uh, theoretical for your examination point of view because you might not get a very severe pneumothorax patient for a case, but you need to know this and this will help you further in your emergencies and your casual persistence if something like this happens. Okay. And percussion myocardia, as I told you, is uh, seen chronically wasted individuals. For example, somebody with a TD, a chronic smoker, is completely malnourished. So it's a sign of some muscle weakness. On percussion, there are fasciculations generated in the muscles, which will be felt. And can be seen as a transient twitching of the muscles. So that is what you need to know. Okay. So we have come towards the end of percussion. Let's go back to our performer. So we are completely understood where exactly we have to focus. 
and what are the sounds which we are going to look for in percussion. Okay, so now the next step is auscultation. So auscultation can be either normal or diminished, and that is what you have to mention. That normal red sounds were heard on auscultation on all areas anteriorly, laterally, and posteriorly. Vesicular heads. Then what kind of sounds were heard? So you have to mention it was vesicular, bronchial, tubular, cavernous, or amphoric. Then if any adventitious red sounds were heard, for example, crepes or wheezing. Okay, and then vocal resonance. Then succussion splash. These are some specific things like succussion splash, post-dissection, section, and hammer scratch. So let's talk about what they are exactly. One by one, coming back to our notes. Okay, so what are we talking about now? Auscultation. Now, just must be done to note the type of breathing, presence of any adventitious sounds, and vocal resonance. Here are three main things. Besides that, succussion slash, post section are different things. They are miscellaneous. Three things are very important which you cannot forget is this. Now, what are the types of sounds which we normally can hear? Vesicular. Vesicular. Bronchial. And bronchial has further two, three types, which is tubular, cavernous, and amphoric. Tubular. Cavernous. And amphoric. Now let's understand what exactly produces these kind of sounds. Now what happens is, vesicular is the active inspiratory sound because the passage of air into the bronchi and the alveoli followed by no pause and a passive expiration which is because of elastic required. Didn't I tell you that your lungs, when they receive air, it is because of passage through the bronchi then it goes through the alveoli and then because your alveoli are so elastic that they collapse. Once they are filled with air, and the inspiratory uh, effort turns down when the turns off the inspiratory effort is gone what happens is this will collapse back and when it collapses back the air gets pushed out again so this was because of an effort it was active okay and this was passive because of the elastic recoil and there is no pause in between the two the air comes in comes in comes in fills the alveoli now there is no more effort suddenly this collapses and the air goes out this is active this is passive this is inspiration this is expiration now what happens is the character of the sound is rustling because of the passage through the alveoli which selectively transmits only the lower frequency and dampens the higher frequency which is normally heard over the chest. So what kind of sound is transmitted through this parenchyma? Only the low type of sounds. So low frequency sounds will be transmitted and this has a rustling nature as if something is passing through the leaves. That kind of a nature it is called as the rustling sounds. And your normal breathing sounds are vesicular, not bronchial because the lung and the chest wall acts as an acoustic filter, narrowing down the range of audible frequencies to only the lower kind of frequencies. Okay, so now do you understand? Now when we ask you to make a diagram of these vesicular breath sounds, what happens is you will have a longer inspiratory phase. Why? Because it is active, it takes time to go through the entire uh, passage, the bronchi, then the uh, lower bronchi, respiratory bronchioles, and the air sacs finally to the alveoli. Now since it is reaching up to the alveoli, finally, at the end of inspiratory effort, there is elastic recoil and suddenly the air comes out because of the elastic recoil. So this is very fast. This is inspiration, no pause, expiration. Inspiration, no pause, expiration. This is how you draw the vesicular breath sound. Okay. Now, if you've understood this, come towards bronchial. So what happens in bronchial breath sounds? Here, there is an active inspiration because of passage of air to the bronchi. Only active inspiration part, passage of air through the bronchus. Now, since here we don't have the alveolar phase, the alveolar phase is here. The alveolar phase is not present, so there is a pause here. This rest of these sounds will be here. Rest of the work goes on here. And then finally, there is an air coming back. So if you place your stethoscope over the bronchus, you will feel an inspiratory sound coming. There will be a pause because rest of the air is going here. And then after the expiration starts, this comes back and there will be an expiratory sound. So what is the diagram for a bronchial breath sound? There is inspiration. A pause and expiration. Both of these are equal. Okay. Because the rest of the work is happening in the parenchyma. This is not reflected here. So you have an inspiration sound, expiration sound, and there is a pause. This is how you draw bronchial breath sound. Now, this is going to be normal only on the bronchus, only on the airway spaces. But suppose you are auscultating a patient's lung. You're auscultating a patient's lung, and there you are, you are able to see bronchial breath sounds. Is this normal? No, it's not normal because you are supposed to have the alveolar phase reflecting in the sounds. You do not, do not see the pause. You should not see the expiratory 
stays so long and equal to inspiratory phase. So why does this happen? It happens because whenever there is consolidation in the alveoli, whenever there is a consolidation here in the alveoli, what happens is the expiratory phase is no more passive. There is no elastic recoil. There is no elastic recoil. And so the expiratory phase is no more passive. This also becomes active. And when it becomes active, there is no phase of elastic recoil. It takes some time to come back and it goes almost equal and there is a pause and it becomes bronchial breast sound. So when will you hear it? Whenever there is a cavity, whenever there is a consolidation, a partial collapse and a pneumothorax above the level of pleural effusion. So because there is some consolidation and air is passing, pa passing through the air spaces, the terminal bronchioles and other bronchioles, so those sounds are getting transmitted and here they go, they're going to have this bronchial character. Bronchial character. And that is called as what? If this was called rustling, these sounds are called hollow sounds. Hollow. They're called as hollow bronchial character. Hollow bronchial character. And then what are these three types of bronchioles? So these three types of bronchioles, only thing you can remember is this is going to be high pitch and these two are slightly lower pitch. Tubular ones are found in consolidation. That is the basic bronchial sound, consolidation. Okay, or any pleural effusion. So above the pleural effusion level, the lungs is present above the pleural effusion loss of tubular. Cavernous is any irregular cavity. For example, a lung abscess which is not healing, so there is some cavity produced, irregular lung cavity, or any destroyed part, okay, that can have a cavernous sound. And amphoric is present in a very smooth, walled, and regular cavity. Also can be present on open pneumothorax. So any smooth, walled, regular cavities. are going to specifically transmit low-pitched hollow sounds called amphoric sounds. So to be able to know these, you have to cure multiple patients of consolidation, the regular cavities, with smooth walled regular cavities or some open pneumothorax. So you might find out what exactly these sounds are. But at least a theory you should know that when do we hear what sounds and what are they exactly. So can you now make a diagram of these sounds? Right? You understand now why these sounds are like that? Why? This active, this is passive, and so this takes time, this does not take time, and the alveolar connection produces no pause at all. But when the alveolar are completely consolidated, filled with fluid, there is no elastic recoil happening. So the expiratory phase is no more passive, it becomes active as well. So both of these become active phases, inspiration as well as expiration. And since there is no collapse, it takes some time to generate expiration. Since there is no elastic recoil, it takes some time to generate this expiration, and there is a pause in between the two, both of them being equal. Normally, it is present on the bronchus, so on the trachea, on the bronchus, in the interscapular spaces. Uh, if you produce, pr place your um, stethoscope, you are going to normally hear the bronchial sound. If you place your stethoscope on the trachea, you are going to normally hear the bronchial sounds. But if you hear for bronchial sounds over the lung, that means it is associated with some consolidation, some pleural effusion, some irregular cavity, some smooth walled regular cavity or pneumothorax. All right. Okay. Now, these were the sounds, the normal sounds. What about the uh, additional? Additional uh, sounds. These are called as your adventitious sounds. You know, what are those adventitious sounds? The number one, the most important one is wheels. The second one is rails. Rails is also known as crepitations. So yeah, you don't forget these names, the alternate names, because you might know what are crepitations, but then somebody asks you what are rails and you get confused. So nothing, rails are crepitations only. And these uh, also have another name. You tell me what they are also called as? Yeah, they're also called as bronchi. So bronchi and crepitations, these are the more refined terms now. Bronchi and crepitations. So what is bronchi? Bronchi is nothing but a continuous musical sound generated by air buzzing passing the air. It is something which passes through a slightly obstructed airway, slightly obstructed airway. So the turbulence which is generated produces a musical sound. This turbulence produces some kind of a musical sound. So musical sound is the key word. Whenever somebody asks you, what are wrong? So a musical sound generated by air passing through an airway. And then when do you hear for it? So I think everybody knows it. Wrong The most important answer. 
is asthma, bronchial asthma. It can be heard in bronchitis. It can be heard in any chronic obstructive lung disease, in some localized obstruction associated with malignancy. It can also be sometimes heard with cardiac failure whenever there is pulmonary edema. It can be heard there as well. So this is about diseases. And then rails, also known as crepitations. What are these? So crepitations or rails are associated with what? These are nothing but crackling sounds. So how do you define them? How do you talk about them? They're nothing but crackling sounds. So for that, to demonstrate, you can just rub your uh, hair between your two fingers and you feel for some sound and that is the sound of a rail or a crepitation. So what happens is because of explosive opening of the airways in that part of the lung that is deflated to the residual volume. So suppose uh, this is part of the lung which is now filled with some fluid. Okay, there's some fluid associated maybe because of uh, pulmonary edema or maybe because of some infection or maybe because there is some sort of fibrosis and this area is now washed out of air. There is only some residual volume present. Now, when you try, try to take an active effort to inspire, what happens is there is sudden popping up, sudden popping up of the air sacs with air. And this produces a kind of crackling sound, which are called your rails. Now, the causes are again, as I've told you, left heart failure associated with consolidation and inflammatory exudates and pneumonia, inflammatory exudate associated with infections like a lung abscess cavity, can be associated with bronchitis or cystic fibrosis, where there is a lot of exudate associated and can be seen with COPD with uh, fibrosis and these have some specific different characters so what are the characters let's talk about them so whenever it's associated with fibrosis these crepitations are going to be having a late inspiratory character late inspiratory that means towards the end in the alveolar phase we are going to hear it something which is late inspiratory can be associated with fibrosis can also be associated with heart failure or pulmonary edema. So even pulmonary edema has a late inspiratory rail. Okay. Then what else? If you have a mid inspiratory range, that means somewhere in the terminal respiratory bronchioles, that means it is associated with bronchiectasis, it is associated with COPD. So involvement of the terminal respiratory bronchioles, it is suggestive of the mid inspiratory. Rail. And then what if it is an early inspiratory rail? It has to be something to do with the larger inspiratory bronchioles. And larger inspiratory bronchioles, larger airways can be seen with chronic bronchitis again. So chronic bronchitis again will produce what kind of rail? Early inspiratory. Okay. Even lung abscess can produce mid inspiratory. So, mid inspiratory, specifically bronchitis, even cystic fibrosis, and sometimes COPD. COPD, chronic bronchitis can produce early inspiratory because of involvement of the larger airways. And then, late inspiratory is more importantly associated with fibrosis or involvement of the alveolar areas with edema. So, late inspiratory. These are the three types of rails which we need to know and where exactly will you find them. Okay. Now, besides that, can we uh, auscultate some other sounds? So if you remember that uh, during, in, during inspection also, we had talked about a few other sounds. So what were those sounds? Anything like a strider may also be heard even more louder on auscultation. A strider of the upper airway obstruction, for example, in the larynx or in the upper part of the trachea. So that will be heard there. Okay? So strider can also be heard. And even if there is a pleural friction rub, that will be heard again on auscultation in pleural inflammation as a rubbing or creaking sound. Uh, audible during both the phases of respiration, which disappears on holding blood. It's very confined and does not get altered by coughing and can be associated with local pain, pain during inspiration. So all of that can be associated with a pleural friction rub. And the other thing which I want to talk about is Hamans, media skin and crunch. So when do we hear this? This is something called as a clicking or a rhythmic sound with cardiac cycle. And this is heard with or without a stethoscope also in media signal in What is it? Heard in media signal in What is this? What do we understand with in Anything which destroys the airspace and fills a lot of air in that? Now, if 
air is not present in the lung but actually comes out and fills the mediastinum the mediastinum is the area where your heart lies right where your heart lies where there are the important vessels where there is esophagus and trachea so this entire area the mediastinum has now air filled in it which normally has nothing but now has air filled in it. so what happens is with every heart beat with every movement of the heart of uh, Uh, systole and diastole this air keeps moving and put, and creating a uh, turbulence and sounds so this air keeps moving and creates sounds which can be auscultated on the mediastinum in the form of a crunch a clicking sound as i told you a clicking sound and that keeps on synchronously happening the sound keeps synchronously happening with every systole with every diastole so it's sort of matches with your heartbeat and that is called as your mediastinal crunch and when do we have mediastinal emphysema so any uh, fistula which is connecting the pleural space with the mediastinum maybe because of a long standing infection and empyema or it can happen whenever there is a uh, esophageal rupture also so esophageal rupture can produce this kind of a sound okay so that is called as hamans mediastinal crunch which also can be heard in auscultation and finally the last thing to auscultate is vocal resonance so like we asked the patient to say 111 and we had forecast or we had palpated the patient right we had palpated the patient to feel for any abnormality of the resonance abnormality of the sounds which was heard this time they are going to ask the patient to say 111 and again we are going to auscultate simultaneously so when we auscultate simultaneously any difference in the nature of character of the sound on both the sides has to be looked for when you auscultate on both the sides so if any side is more loudly heard it means again it is consolidated there is a pleural effusion etc etc no it's consolidated no pleural effusion and if the sound is decreased it is either because of pleural effusion or it is because of pneumothorax because whenever there is a change of medium the vibrations get altered and so that the sound vocal resonance there are three different types and that is what i want you to know the so three different types of vocal resonance the diminished ones are fine they are diminished as in as i told you in patients with pleural effusion and pneumothorax but if they are increased or some some specific character is noted then those three characters have been named as bronchophony egophony and whispering pectoral loci whispering pectoral loci so when did i tell you that this sound get diminished the vocal resonance is diminished or decreases whenever there is any change in medium okay so what do i mean by change in medium for example if the lung gets filled with air excess air if there is a barrier of air between the lungs and the chest wall or if there is a barrier of fluid between the lung and the chest wall so when does a barrier of air come it comes whenever there is pneumothorax and when does the barrier of fluid come whenever there is pleural effusion or if there is an empyema an infection filled space so all of these are the cases where your vocal resonance will diminish whenever there is a barrier between the two but when does it increase so it increases in a few causes and they have different characters which i have named there for you one is bronchophony the other one is egophony and there is whispering pectoral loci so one specific uh, description for all of these if i want to give you i'll tell you bronchophony is something where the sound will be loud and clear but the words will not be distinguishable words are not distinguishable so you may say that it's loud and the words are not distinguishable because clear might confuse you right so these are not distinguishable but egophony is when the sounds are auscultated but they have slightly nasal quality to it nasal quality like a bleating of a goat bleating of a goat so i remember egophony as goatophony something like a goat okay egophony is nasal quality bronchophony is bada it's loud but they are not distinguishable but whispering pectorally loci is when the sounds are going to be whispered if you ask the patient to just say very slowly you ask the patient to whisper but still the auscultation will give you loud sounds and very very clear sounds very very clear sounds that they are very very distinguishable as well 
distinguishable. So some whisper which becomes very loud is whispering. Like pecti loka hai. The sounds which remain loud but they're not very distinguishable is bronchophony. And when it becomes like a goat, it is egophony. So when do we hear for these sounds? Bronchophony is anywhere on consolidations. It is heard over any cavity or any part of the lung which is expanded above the level of a above the level of the pleural effusion. So any lung above the level of pleural effusion. By the way, do you remember the sound which is percussed over a lung above the level of pleural effusion? Just seen it recently. So the lung above the level of the pleural effusion gives you a sub tympanic resonance called as the hyper resonance, hyper resonance, kodaic resonance. That was percussion. But when you hear for auscultation about this with a vocal resonance, what will you hear for? You will hear for bronchophony on the lung above the level of pleural effusion. Now, egophony, which is bleeding of the goat, is found on any lung again above the level of pleural effusion. So, they can also show you bronchophony, it can also show you egophony. Lung above the level of pleural effusion, and what is the mechanism actually? So, the lung which is relaxed just above the level of pleural effusion is able to transmit the overtones, transmits overtones, but does not transmit the lower tones, but dampens the lower fundamental tones, and that leads to egophony. And the spring picture look at the two things one is any cavity communicating with bronchus, cavity which is communicating with the bronchus, or any consolidation just up adjacent to the level of bronchus. So any consolidation adjacent to the bronchus. Cavity communicating with the bronchus or a consolidation adjacent to the bronchus are two conditions which can produce a whispering victory look at. By the way, the other two names which are given to you was percussion splash and post after suction. Right? So here we also had something called a succussion splash and post-tussive suction. So if there is some, suppose, a hydronemothorax, so again, the pleura is filled half with fluid and above it is fluid with air, the clear-cut fluid air in the space. So if you make this per person, you suddenly vibrate this patient, okay? Suddenly you shake this patient and then you auscultate. So the movement of the fluid within this air-filled cavity gives this sound that is called a succussion splash. So it's a very random thing. I don't know if they actually do it nowadays. And the other thing was post passive suction. So you ask the patient to cuff, and after cuffing, you place auscultation. So a suckling sound is heard over the chest wall during the long inspiration that follows the bout of cuffing, which indicates thin walled compressible lung cavity communicating with the bronchus. So any thin walled cavity, if it's communicating with the bronchus, after cuffing, will produce this kind of a sound, a sucking sound, and that is called as post passive suction. Hammond's crunch, I've told you, anything producing a mediastinal emphysema is going to produce a clicking sound going synchronously with the heartbeats, and that is called as a Hammond's crunch. So, auscultation is also done. So, see, finally, we have completed this entire part of inspection. Remember, in the lower respiratory tract, I told you that the first thing we look for is the shape. The shape has to look for the AP and transverse diameter. Just observe for the symmetry. Look if everything looks symmetrical on both the sides. Is there any hollowing or bulging? Is there any chest wall deformity or any spinal deformities on the back side? Then you look for the movements, for the rate, the rhythm, the character, the type, the patterns. I told you the kind stroke, which was that crescent or decrescent, or the crazy pattern, which was push walls. Then there was another one. Uh, which was B odds, which was very chaotic. B odds was chaotic, right? So all of that. Then symmetry, the signs of labor, breathing presence of any accessory muscles of the respiration, overworking, retractions and open mouth breathing, first lip breathing for COPD. Finally, we went to look for the mediastinal position. It has to be central. So we look for the trail sign, any prominence of the sternocleidomastoid muscles on the sternum, the apex impulse, which has to be normally in its position. Then miscellaneous things like scars of drainage, dilated veins, and shiny skin in Pisces. Then we went on to palpate, confirming the inspiratory findings. We look for the temperature, the tenderness for any subcutaneous emphysema, for any empire margin, presence of redness and collection of pus under the skin, communicating with the pleural uh, cavity. Then we measured the chest. We measured the chest by placing a cardboard. We looked for uh, 
the AP diameter and the transverse diameter. We can lay out the ratio of it. Then we look for the hemithorax uh, circumferences to see if both the hemithoraces were equal. Then we look for chest expansion, which has to be 5 to 7 centimeters. Then we look for hemithorax expansion, which has to be equal on both the sides. The movements on the anterior, that is on the posterior and the apex on one position each. You don't have to go from up to go down. Only one position of the apex, one position on the posterior side, one position on the anterior side, demonstrating which two uh, mechanics, the pump handle movement and the bucket handle movement. And then again, the mediastinum tracheal position is confirmed by placing three fingers and insinuating fingers between the trachea and the sternocleidomastoid muscle. And we also felt for the apex sleeve, which has to be in the left fifth intercostal space, half a centimeter medial to the mid clavicular line. Has to be half a centimeter medial to the mid clavicular line. And finally, we went on to also look for miscellaneous for palpatory findings, which was any tactile vocal premitus has to be equal on both the sides and friction premitus. So when we ask the patient to say one, 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 and we feel by our ulnar border on those particular sides, which I showed you on the body and the friction premitus. And on per percussion, we looked in the anterior area at the apex, which is chronic distalness. And finally, we also looked at the clavicular area, the infraclavicular and the mammary areas, the axillary in the infraxillary areas, posteriorly in the suprascapular, interscapular and infrascapular areas. Then the right hemothorax, we had to look for the liver dullness extent, the liver span along with tidal percussion to look for if the liver moves down with inspiration properly and goes up with expiration properly or if there is permanent dullness of empyema, permanent dullness of subdiaphragmatic abscess or amoebic abscess, etc. Then we also had to look for the left hemothorax for the throb space percussion as well as the cardiac dullness, right? Then in suspected hydropneumothorax, we had to do shifting dullness demonstration by asking the patient to sit and then focus and asking the patient to lie down on the normal side and again focus to look for the tympanic node or the dull node becoming tympanic again. Then in suspected pneumothorax, we had to do coin percussion and listen to the sounds, auscultate, focus the sound. Then percussion myokymia was seen in chronically wasted individuals. Then auscultation again, we had to look for the normal sound or if it was diminished, the types of sounds which was vesicular, bronchial, cavernous or amphoric. Then the adventitious breath sounds which were associated with it like reels and bronchi. Then the vocal resonance by asking the patient to say 111 again and auscultating with all those types of sounds. Either they were diminished or it was increased. Increased in the form of bronchophony, egophony and whispering pectrinoci. Besides, in hydronomothorax, violently vibrating or moving the patient to hear for this flash or for a patient having a thin wall cavity communicating with the bronchus, asking the patient to cough it out and then you're able to feel for that suction sound, post digestive suction with Hemans crunch for mediastinal emphysema. So finally, once we have completely examined the patient, we can give the diagnosis by the anatomy, the pathology, the etiology, the complications and the risk factor. For example, chronic smoking and some environmental risk factor if it was present. So that is how you mention. By the way, this was something which was mentioned in Hutchison that when you palpate, the wrist and the forearm should be in the same horizontal plane where possible. Even if this means you have to bend down the near the patient, kneel down by the patient's side. The best palpation technique involves molding the relaxed hand on the abdominal wall, not to hold it rigid. You should mold the hand with respect to the body surface. The best movement has to be very gentle, but with firm pressure, with the fingers head almost straight, but with slight flexion where at the metacarpophalangeal joints. You don't have to move the fingers at the interphalangeal joints. Neither we have to move the wrist, but we have to flex it at the metacarpophalangeal joint and avoid any sudden poking with the fingertips. So this is how your palpation should look like. Okay. So since we have completed our performa, I want to just quickly show you the highlighted portions of Hutchison. We have almost covered everything because I've brought together all the three things together. But still, I want you to see a few things. Like when you inspect, we had looked for scars. We had looked for any tracheostomy scars. So scars has, what scar exactly have you looked for? That is what has been mentioned here. In the movement of the chest, as we see, we look for intercostal recession, growing into the intercostal space with inspiration. So suggestive of some severe upper airway obstruction. And in COPD, the lower ribs often move paradoxically inwards on inspiration instead of the normal outward movement. So the contraction of the diaphragm rather pulls the lower ribs inwards 
and that paradoxical inward movement is also called as Hoover's sign. So this Hoover's sign is an important part. Besides that, there is another Hoover sign in uh, central nervous system, and I want you to mention it down in the comments if you know it. And the lymph nodes, any swelling, and tenderness, etc., etc. Okay. Chest expansion. By simple inspection, possible asymmetrical expansion can be explored further by palpation. Then we face the patient, place the fingertips of both the hands on either side of the lower rib cage so that the tip of the thumbs meet in the midline and they're not touching the skin. Okay, they should not be touching the skin. You have to keep your thumbs slightly away from the chest wall when you're measuring the chest expansion and then look for the thumbs getting separated. A single deep breath by the patient will increase the distance between the thumbs and indicate the degree of expansion. If any one thumb remains closer to the midline, this suggests a diminished expansion on that side. Essentially, the hands are being used like a pair of calipers to measure the expansion in the lateral base of the lung, where maximum expansion occurs. So that is where you keep your arms, keep your palms, and the thumbs have to be slightly away from the chest wall. And remember when you percuss, the movement has to be at your wrist rather than at your elbow. Your wrist should be moving. Your wrist should be moving with your percussing finger, okay? The percussing finger is bent so that its terminal phalanx is at right angles and strikes the other finger perpendicularly. As soon as the blow has been given, make sure that the striking finger is raised. The striking finger has to be raised because the action has to be a tapping movement. You cannot just let your finger be there after percussing because that will dampen the sound. You don't allow dampening of the sound. You percuss and you quickly lift up the finger. You percuss and you quickly lift up the finger. It has to be perpendicular and has to be at your wrist movement. Okay. So this is where the movement has to occur. It should not happen at the elbow. You're not hammering the patient. Okay. You're percussing the patient. They're very important. Now, the two common mistakes made by the beginner at first is failing to ensure that the finger of the left hand is applied flatly formally to the chest wall and second thing is striking the percussion blow from the elbow rather than from the wrist which should never happen. Mm -hmm. The character of the sound produced varies both qualitatively and quantitatively. When the air in the cavity of sufficient size and appropriate shape is set by breathing, a resonant sound is produced and there is also a characteristic sensation felt by the finger placed on the chest. So there is both which you have to feel the sound also and the sensation also. Try tapping a hollow cupboard and then a solid wall. The feeling is different as well as the sound is different. So the sound and feel has to be learned by practice. And it is against the standard that possible abnormalities may be judged. Okay. Now, percuss over the clavicles. Traditionally, this is done without any intervening finger. We can directly percuss on the clavicle, directly hit the clavicle. But there is no reason for this. And it's more comfortable for the patient if you put a finger in between. So you can do either which piece. There's no specific reason why you have to do that way. And the uh, auscultation, as we have mentioned, we had vesicular breath sounds, which was normal, bronchial breath sounds, which were heard on consolidation, or the lungs above the level of pleural effusion, or a com cavity communicating with the bronchus. Remember, then vocal fremitus and resonance, we had two types whispering pectoral loci in any association with consolidation with the bronchus, cavity communicating with the bronchus, egophony on the top of pleural effusion, as well as consolidation, and the other one was bronchophony again with consolidation. Added sounds were pleural lub associated with infection, diseases associated with asthma, infection, cardiac failure, crackles or crepitations or rails, which are all, all the same things, are pulmonary fibrosis, cardiac failure, and COPD. So, we basically completed our performa of the respiratory system. I'm going to post this uh, PDF of the respiratory system performa for you under this video. I want you all to print this paper out. Besides this paper, I want you to have another paper, uh, another blank paper, and whatever I have taught you uh, in the form of these flowcharts for vocal resonance, 
for bronchial breath sounds for uh, percussion sounds and the other part of uh, respiratory system general examination along with clubbing i want you to write this down for yourself if you want to because this is going to help you this one paper of performa and this other paper of all the important findings these two papers are going to contain everything about respiratory system examination for a quick revision and after this if you want you can quickly also go through hutchison for your for your own reading and make sure that you understand everything well and keep on practicing you keep print and then try to remember you can print this performa one or two more for yourself and then take this performa with you in the ward when you try to take an examination initially you can just uh, mark your findings over this with a rough uh, pencil and then make it fair so eventually you will remember all the points of this performa and so that you don't think that this is something very out of the world you can remember this and do it as a reflex every time you see a respiratory case okay thank you so much this is the end of the session one last thing that remains is i want you to hear to the few normal breath sounds by the way you can hear it on your patients when it's you hear also on your normal friends around you to hear so what normal vesicular breath sounds sounds like and how bronchial breath sounds uh, sound like when you place your stethoscope on the trachea but again you just quickly can go through these things so this is the vesicular breath sound Where inspiration is slightly longer than expiration, there is no pause, and it's a rustling nature of only lower frequency which is getting transmitted. So coming towards bronchial breath sounds. So you see, this is very hollow in nature, and you feel that there is a pause in between the in. Inspiration, expiration. Here it again. A very small pause is notable between the two, and both being in equal duration. Okay, and that was heard anywhere on consolidation, on a cavitation, fibrosis, collapse, or a fistula. All of these. And again, adventitious breath sounds like crackles. Finally, wheezes. It's a musical sound, a high-pitched musical sound, which is when the air tries to travel through narrowed parts with secretions, with foreign bodies, with obstructive lesions. So it is a kind of a sound produced during the movement of air through a reed. Yeah. That are called wheezes. Alright, so this comes towards the end of the session.